We live in a world where spending never stops. <laughs> Sheree! Sheree! You're going to need to be tannoy in this. <laughs> but why do we buy what we buy? And how is our desire to spend manipulated? Every other company on earth is trying to get you to spend money, and they're putting all their effort into getting you to spend your money on stuff all the time. I'm Jacques Peretti, and in this series, I'm going to investigate the men who've made us spend. I'll discover how products were deliberately made to break so we'd buy more. Plan obsolescence is an open secret. When I'm talking to professional management people, and they all say, well, we all know this. How we've been reprogrammed to dispose of our possessions. I don't think individual advertising campaigns change people's views completely. Well, uh, why just, are they still doing it? Then? No, they're not still doing it. Well, actually. they did in 2012. You yeah. ran a campaign that said you should leave your sofa on yeah. the sidewalk. And how technology has been used to perfect consumerism, making us constantly hungry for more. We want the new thing. It's hardwired into our brain to be looking for new stuff. The marketers have figured out how to take advantage of that. This looks like a concert, but it isn't. It's a lavish promotional video for the launch of a new gaming console, the Xbox One. Five, four, three, two, one. And the star of the show is a small plastic box costing 450 pounds. Consumer technology has moved center stage. This footage shows how it's treated with an awestruck reverence once reserved for A-list celebrity. Except now, it's a console. And Xbox learned about the orchestrated hysteria around a product launch from the masters, Apple. For the past seven years, people have queued for hours or even days to get their hands on the latest upgrade. We've been out here 15 days, two weeks, and one day. But what drives people to wait in the cold for a new phone? I've come to the Apple store on Regent Street to talk to the very patient man at the front of the queue for the new iPhone 5S. And what's the 5S going to do that the 5 doesn't do? Um, really, probably not much. There's a fingerprint scanner, which is very cool. So you've queued for three days to buy a new phone that is not going to do much more than the phone you've got at the moment. At the end, the walk around is something new that we all want. Thousands of people are waiting in line. How long have you guys been waiting? 18 hours. 18 hours. What is it that's so special about having the, the newest phone, the latest phone? The rate that they change, they change so quickly, you don't want to be left behind as such, do you? Why is it so important for you to have the, the latest phone so quickly? Because this time they, they are in different colour. Because it's a different colour? Yep. That's what's, that's what's brought you here? Yep. It's a part of my life at the moment. It's one minute to eight, and the doors of this Apple store are about to open, and close to 3,000 people queuing are going to go in and buy the iPhone 5S. And the allure, the magic of owning that phone, the new phone, is still there. It's like a Hollywood premiere, and all because you can get a phone that's a little faster. But the flip side of the hysteria for the new is that the new becomes unwanted, fast. 
Yesterday's desired item is tomorrow's piece of trash. This is a waste facility in California, like thousands across the globe. Except this is one with a difference. There are boxes and boxes of shiny, new, unopened technology. If you look around here, you'll see quite a few brand new products still in their boxes. So yeah, there's some, there's some princes there. Yeah, yeah, brand new, never been opened. Here's, here's a bunch more right here. And wow. those are... They've never been used. So never these, been all used. these are, wow. Yeah. So those are products that, um, for one reason or another, they decided that they would rather destroy than yeah. try to sell to somebody who might need them. This cycle of things becoming almost instantaneously obsolete is at the heart of consumerism today. After festivals, sites are strewn with brand new tents used just once. Many of us are happy to spend and discard, and it's this churn of products that supports our whole economy. And the concern is that our economic recovery is being driven once again by consumer spending. We live in a world of almost limitless consumption, but this didn't happen by accident. The cycle of relentless spending and throwing away was engineered. But how did this happen? To discover its origins, I've come to Berlin. In the 1920s, manufacturers hit upon an idea that would become fundamental to the consumer economy, artificially limiting the lifespan of a product. It was known as planned obsolescence, making a product that is deliberately designed to break. Planned obsolescence began with one of the most basic consumer products of all, the light bulb. This is the former Osram factory in East Berlin. It hid a secret about light bulb production until the fall of the Berlin Wall. In the early 1990s, long forgotten papers were discovered in this factory they revealed an extraordinary secret deal that would provide the template for the consumer obsolescence we live with today. In the 1920s, a coordinated decision had been taken by a global cartel of companies to reduce the lifespan of bulbs. It was known as the Phoebus Cartel. The cartel's origins came from the chairman of Osram. His name was William Meinhardt. Meinhardt wanted to standardise and control the way in which light bulbs were manufactured. In 1924, the world's biggest electrical companies hammered out a deal in Geneva. Its aim was to increase profits by fixing prices and production quotas. It would also dictate the length of time a light bulb could last What's extraordinary is that the rules governing the way the cartel would control production were all written down in minute detail. These papers were discovered by German researcher Helmut Herger. Helmut, how did you first come by these documents? Well, I know after the war came down, I, I knew the Workers' Council people of the light bulb factory. And uh, when the factory closed down, they saved the archive. This first point is one, control. The life of general lighting service lamps shall be controlled. Before the Phoebus cartel existed, how long did a light bulb last? The light bulbs lasted 2,500 hours. And after the Phoebus cartel? They reduced them down to 1,000 hours. The bulb that comes off the assembly line today 
as a filament of pure metallic tungsten that burns white hot for a thousand hours. Bulbs that lasted longer burned less brightly. The companies maintain that the thousand hour lifespan was a compromise between these two factors, durability and efficiency. Yet the impact on sales was phenomenal. The year the agreement was signed, one lighting company executive wrote, all manufacturers are committed to our program of standardization. It is expected to double the business of all parties within five years. And any company that broke the cartel was threatened with fines. It's incredible because actually when you look at the rules that have been written down, this is called basis of fining. It says if, if it lasts 20 hours more, you'll be paying so much money. 50 hours more, a higher amount, All 75 hours more. Swiss money, yeah. The Phoebus cartel was ended by the war. But Helmut has uncovered hard proof of planned obsolescence. And others are investigating how it operates today. I've come to meet Stefan Schrider at Berlin Technical University. Stefan is studying obsolescence in consumer goods and is shocked by how pervasive it is. Plan obsolescence is an open secret. When I'm talking to professional management people and congresses and so, they all said, well, we all know this. Stefan has identified obsolescence in everything from washing machines with heating elements which fail too early to electric toothbrushes with sealed panels, preventing you from changing the batteries. The clearest example of all is the printer cartridge. This is from a printer, right? Yeah, this is from a printer, it's a cartridge. Okay. And there's a counter inside. What does the counter do? It counts the pages you've been printing with this cartridge. So it is there, it's like a clock, counting no. down to 50,000 pages. And Cal then it's say, saying, I'm empty. And that's, it's just this it. simple dial here is effectively counting down yeah. to the moment that it stops working. Yeah. So you can re reset the counter, you know, you can reset it. And a friend of mine, just do it. He reset it, put it inside again, and it's still printing. And he's putting it down to zero, he reset it for three times, and it's still printing. That's... All you'd have to do is reset it and it would work, but yeah. instead you have to buy a brand new cartridge. A brand new one or refilling it. Yeah. This is planned obsolescence in the cartridge of a pin truck, obviously. The open secret of planned obsolescence that Stefan talks about is now becoming increasingly sophisticated. Manufacturers are even being accused of inserting electronic chips into printers to tell us the ink has run out when it hasn't. Planned obsolescence is now being woven into the very fabric of our everyday lives. We live in a world of products designed to have a limited lifespan and accept it. But why? Because the idea of continual spending is deeply embedded in our collective consciousness. Not as a needless activity, but as a duty. A duty to consume. This began during the Cold War. The world faced a choice between competing brands, capitalism or communism. Capitalists, they've worked and saved to make the biggest single purchase in their lifetimes. They have a share of America's wealth. They've seen capitalism work. I've come to meet Elizabeth Cohen of Harvard University. How important was um, consumerism as a way of kind of defining democracy? American democracy was viewed as um, really linked deeply to mass consumption. Not only that everybody could have goods and could live an, a, a prosperous life, but that we had choice 
as consumers. In contrast for, to the Soviet Union, where not only did they not have the kind of material goods that Americans had, but they also had no choice. But in the 1950s, cracks were already beginning to show in the edifice of consumerism. In 1951, Ealing comedy, The Man in the White Suit, wryly satirized the idea that the public were being duped by companies using obsolescence. Set in the heart of the industrial north, it imagined what would happen if a product were to be created that never broke. Some fool has invented an indestructible cloth, right? Yes, but it'll knock the bottom out of everything, right down to the primary producers. What about the sheep farmers and the cotton growers? The importers and the middlemen. The big stores, even. It'll ruin all of them. It wasn't only the mill bosses. The mill workers were unhappy. Now what do you think of him? And you think they'll go ahead with it? Certainly. You're not even born yet. What do you think happened to all the other things? The razor blade that never gets blunt, and the, the car that runs on water with a pinch of something in it. No. They'll never let your stuff on the market in a million years. The film reveals that far from being a time of consumer naivety, the 50s saw an acute awareness of an economy built on obsolescence and an active debate about whether the tactic of making goods to break was acceptable. But consumerism was about to face a bigger problem. People weren't buying enough new things fast enough. There was an assumption for, I would say, at least a decade, that there was no end to the prosperity that would come with mass consumption. But at a certain point, and I would say by about the mid-1950s, there were uh, advertising executives, mark ma uh, marketers, who were realizing that there was going to be an end to this profitability, that at a certain point, these markets would get saturated. And what would happen then? And they experimented with different approaches. Um, so how do we get people to keep buying once you have that vacuum cleaner and that refrigerator uh, and that car? If consumerism were to speed up, as manufacturers wanted, they needed a new and far cleverer plan. The answer lay with an idea from one man, the psychological reprogramming of the consumer. His name was Alfred P. Sloan, the head of General Motors. Pessimism has no place in the American schemes of things. I am the greatest possible optimist on the future of America and our whole system. His 33 years at the helm saw the company become the biggest car manufacturer in the world. Before GM, Henry Ford had dominated the market with one uniform car the Model T, and the slogan that you can have any color as long as it's black. But Sloan realized that he could vastly increase sales by offering a different car for every income bracket. He could segment the market over and over. Oh, the good life. Seems to be the ideal. But even having several lines of car wouldn't be enough to keep the sales rolling in. Sloan wanted customers to buy a new car every year, like a new coat or a pair of shoes. GM called this theory of continuous upgrade the organized creation of dissatisfaction. This is the car that epitomized Sloan's new selling philosophy. The 56 Chevrolet Bel Air. Legendary car designer Tom Matineau began his career at General Motors, working to the Sloan philosophy. Oh, this is beautiful. A four door hardtop, the newest of the new, the Bel Air Sport Sedan. Oh, that's a car to fall in love with. How often would he have to change the shell of the car, the appearance? Uh, at that time, the hype of that was every year. Every year? Every year, they change the sheet metal. Wow. 
Is it true, Tom, that this colour, that you get this incredible sheen, it, it was derived from nail polish? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you see the glow? I mean, and again, it's the people matching their dress to the cars or the shoes. Um, it's much more fashionable. Sloan flipped what was important to the consumer on its head. Instead of engine and reliability being main stage, it was now the seemingly superficial add-ons, colour or tail fins, that drove the sale. Chevrolet's Royal Tone styling puts ever more emphasis on exterior colour, a rainbow of 26 entirely new solid tone and two-tone colour combinations. So Sloan, did he reboot um, obsolescence in a way? Because before that, it was planned obsolescence, things mm -hmm. done to an object. Mm -hmm. and he made it about obsolescence being in your head. You yourself would choose to want the new. Yeah, you don't need to buy a new car. In, in mechanical-wise, it's still brand new, year old. But make you feel like the new one's better, and I have to have one is a quite a genius way of doing things. Yeah. Soon, this idea, the organized creation of dissatisfaction, spread across the Western world, helping to drive economies during the boom years of the 1950s and 60s, and to Britain as we came out of austerity. Bathrooms go on getting better every year. They can be improved inexpensively, but it's nice to have a peep at one where money's been no object. Taps running. Half an hour on the phone and she'll be underwater. For two decades, consumers enjoyed a prosperity that was previously unimaginable. The British had embraced consumerism and spending with as much enthusiasm as the Americans had before us. We enjoyed redoing our homes, changing our cars on a regular basis. But this new consumer paradise was about to be hit by hard economic fact. At the end of the 60s, wages, which had previously kept pace with prices, began to stagnate. And by the mid-70s, when prices soared, we had a problem. People were looking through the shop window at the consumer paradise, but could no longer buy it. A chrome standard lamp, a set of stacking stools, a cuddly black cat. <laughs> And I don't think the Labour government fully understood, and I know I, in number 10, didn't fully understand, that the squeeze on real incomes producing falling real incomes in the second half of the 1970s meant that the workers wouldn't put up with it anymore. Do you think that the trade unions were just really trying to keep up living standards for their members and, in a way, pursue the consumer dream. The unions were reacting to the particular situation mm. that their members were suffering reductions in their real incomes. A consequence of that is that they couldn't buy as many of the consumer goods as they'd grown accustomed to and their wives had assumed. So there was a move in the union movement towards individualism, materialism, a bit of grab what you can, regardless of the impact of the rest of society. Demands for higher incomes led to repeated strike action, culminating in the winter of discontent. In the shops, the threat to food supplies is getting larger every day. By the end of the 1970s, consumerism Mark I was over, but its demise had threatened to make Britain ungovernable. 70s Britain feels like another country. So how did we go from the bleakness and conflict of that decade to a 21st century Britain, obsessed not with class war, but shopping? The answer lay with one man, a wealthy chicken farmer, 
who wanted to use his money to bring about a new vision for Britain. Anthony Fisher brought the idea of battery farming to the UK, making millions from his company, Buxted Chickens. Now about a quarter of all the laying hens in this country are kept like this, often thousands of them all under one roof. But Fisher wasn't just a chicken farmer. He cared passionately about freedom of the individual. Fisher believed the British people had been penned in by the state and by trade unions, and he wanted to set them free. After the war, I found England slipping into socialism, the people somehow believing that the government was going to solve all their problems. In the late 1940s, Fischer had become enthralled by the ideas of a radical Austrian economist called Friedrich Hayek. Hayek believed that the government policies of the post-war period were a form of serfdom. Companies and individuals should be free to spend what they want. Fischer wanted to put Hayek's free market philosophy into action. He wanted to become a politician. But Hayek convinced him his money would be better spent on setting up a new type of organisation called a think tank. He told me, keep out of politics and make your case uh, to the intellectuals, that is, the teachers, the, the students and the media, because they, in turn, influence the people. Fisher followed Hayek's advice. In 1955, he set up the Institute of Economic Affairs. Through the years of Wilson and Heath, it toiled away in the wilderness. But with the turmoil of the 1970s, the IEA's moment had suddenly come. Patrick Minford was one of the many young economists who wrote for the organisation at the time. The IEA was, was, was trying to explain to people how free markets worked and that, you know, the best organisation of an economy was one where individual consumers and producers were empowered to produce what people wanted market forces and the idea was you know people would therefore produce better stuff that people actually wanted to buy no longer would britain be divided by tribal loyalties by communities built around localized production now we would be consumers whose spending power would change our sense of belonging in free markets the consumer is sovereign the whole point of free markets is to is to give the consumer sovereignty and to allow people, ordinary people, to conduct their lives in a way they want, which is consumerism. With Britain in chaos, the free market ideas of the IEA were seized upon by conservative politicians, then in opposition. The the and then with their voters all out. Angus, hello, in you go. And in particular, I'll bring you all out in a moment. They were looking for an idea that would give Britain a new, unifying identity, built not on class war, but economic freedom and consumerism. So these were the ideas that were starting to be pushed by writers for the IEA in, in, in the 70s. And they then were taken up by Mrs. Thatcher when she came into the leadership and Keith Joseph to formulate a new strategy. Let me give you my vision. A man's right to work as he will, to spend what he earns, to own property, to have the state as servant and not as master. These are the British inheritance. <laughs> they are the essence of a free economy, and on that freedom all our other freedoms depend. The 70s saw Britain riven by ideological conflict, but the ideas of the Institute of Economic Affairs offered a way out. A new, depoliticised identity for ordinary people, not as workers, but consumers. Freed to spend. The politicians promised us prosperity, built on the economic freedom of this new, consumerism mark II. But to some, this wasn't salvation. It was brainwashing. 
just as 30 years earlier with The Man in the White Suit, consumerism was attacked on film. This time it was a horror movie, Dawn of the Dead. Director George Romero portrayed consumer society not as a form of freedom, but as a new type of slavery. To Romero, the consumer was not an individual, but a zombie, blindly following the herd into the shopping mall. What are they doing? Why do they come here? Some kind of instinct, memory of what they used to do. This was an important place in their lives. But Romero's critique didn't chime with the public mood. Consumerism was about to lift off like nothing ever seen before. Economist Juliet Shaw has examined how the early 1980s laid the foundations for the almost limitless consumption we have today. In the 70s, you had um, wages failing to keep pace with consumerism, which obviously created uh, strife with unions and so on. I'm wondering how, in the 80s, you know, how was it possible for consumerism to keep on the rails? This was a period in which the nature of the sort of consumer culture changed from being one in which people aspired to something 10 to 15 percent more than what they had to being a time when people started aspiring to be rich. And the uh, mechanism that squares that circle, if you will, is consumer credit. Because this is also the time when consumer credit becomes much more available. And that's a relatively new thing. Now all you need to do is pull a little plastic square out of your pocket. It's like a sort of magic fetish. Um, and boom, you're able to buy things that you didn't have the income for. But easing credit was only the first piece in the jigsaw. A new technological innovation would also transform choice and make goods vastly cheaper. And it was brought about by this man, Mike Riddle. Riddle invented a computer program which became AutoCAD. Released in 1982, it allowed designers to use computers to tweak the shape of products in a way previously unimaginable. The explosion of choice would fill the giant new out-of-town retail parks. What did computer-aided design it enable designers to do? It allowed us to make a lot of variations cheaply to the, the big impact was on cost so that we could have hundreds of different designs instead of saying here's the one standard toothbrush we could have hundreds they could all be a little bit different from now on cad would allow everything from perfume bottles and luggage to kitchen equipment even deodorant bottles to be designed on a computer the shape and um, the, the, the the molding the shaping of things that was that was a a new innovation as a result, wasn't it? The ability to do that. Right. Before, before CAD, these products all tended to come in very, very similar containers. You would buy a bottle, like you look at uh, shampoo or lotion bottles. Mm. They would all be uh, a straight cylinder, a different yeah. top, maybe a different label. Yeah. Now, everyone has a different shape, subtle curves to it, things they would never have thought of before because it would have been too expensive. By enabling an array of dizzying choice, CAD made things desirable and cheap. And this new 1980s world of consumer wonder created an unprecedented consumer binge. New products become very important. Um, the, the turnover in the fashion cycle really shrinks, and that's part of what my research shows, which is the amount of time between when a, per, a household or a person buys something and when they discard it because it is no longer socially valuable, not because it doesn't work anymore, it still has utilitarian value, but because it is passe, it's no longer 
something that is worth anything because there's a new model out. Watch. And the trailblazer for disposability was the reinvention of the watch. Swatches supercharged ads show how they turned an old-fashioned business based on quality which lasted a lifetime into the symbol of 80s fast, disposable consumerism. These days, it's fashion that makes us tick. Swatch, the new wave in Swiss watches. Oh, wow, this is your collection of watches. Yep. Darren Clare worked as head of sales for Swatch in the UK. Darren, how was Swatch able to turn a watch from something that you had for a lifetime to, to you know, basically these, you know, owning one of these and then wanting another one and another one and another one? Um, I think really the key was um, linking into the fashion industry and also having 100 plus new watches every single year being launched. So we had a spring, summer and an autumn, winter um, collection every single year. As glamorous as a Duran Duran video, the ads were aimed at young, fashion-conscious consumers. I like your swatch. Sink or swim in it. Work out in a gym in it. A swatch is made to take it because it's Swiss made. Swatch! And it was, it was brand new. I mean, I think it was literally market changing mm. because nobody had done anything like this before. Swatch wanted people to buy four watches a year. They sold a million in 1983, their first year, and by 1986, were selling 12 million. Swatch revealed how much money could be made by turning what had been a long-lasting consumer item into a frequent purchase. And even though a Swatch was cheap, it was made desirable by being designer. The designer revolution of the 80s and 90s cloaked a tidal wave of cheap goods onto the high street that we bought and discarded without shame. But it's one company that epitomised the new junction of cheap throwaway goods and designer lifestyle aspiration like no other. IKEA. I had to have it. The Klipsk personal office unit. The Hovertrek home exerbike or the Johann Schad sofa. IKEA's totemic place in consumer culture was first highlighted in Fight Club. Person. I had it all, even the glass dishes with tiny bubbles and imperfections. IKEA was singled out as the brand Edward Norton's anti-hero cannot escape from. His obsessive desire to fill his house with their furniture shows how consumerism has taken over his life. It wasn't just Edward Norton's character in Fight Club. We were all rushing to conform. Like everyone else in Britain, I filled my house top to bottom with IKEA. I had a dream, a to the company was founded in the 1940s by Ingvar Kamprad. From the beginning, he was single-minded in his ambition, and today it's the world's largest furniture retailer. But it was in the 90s, when IKEA conquered Britain, that its profits went stratospheric. By 1994, IKEA had global sales of nearly five billion a year. They queued from the early hours for a first glimpse into the Aladdin's cave alongside the M62. I believe in angels. Johann Stenebo worked at IKEA for 30 years, climbing the ladder to become Kamprad's right-hand man. And what happened when IKEA came to Britain? First of all, IKEA's uh, concept was enormously strong, and there was a huge void in the market in, in the UK. Their ads cleverly sought to persuade the British public to buy into the new homestyle revolution. Chuck out that jeans, come on, do it today. Rise off that helmet and throw it away. So there came IKEA with all these colourful Scandinavian ideas of how to, uh, you know, uh, furnish your home. Our homes could be playful and happy and light, loose and informal and stripy and bright. And what IKEA did was to elevate the prices. So IKEA in the UK had the highest prices because there wasn't any competition who would blame them. They weren't, uh, had the high, highest prices in the whole IKEA world. Therefore, IKEA in the UK had the highest profits. So it was an, an enormous success. And, and uh, I think uh, people were 
uh, way up in IKEA were dumbfounded by the success. Britain no longer has the highest prices in the IKEA world, but the prices didn't stop IKEA changing the way British people bought furniture. Do you think that IKEA ushered in the disposable, throwaway culture that we live in today? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, we were definitely guilty of that. When IKEA got to the US, they made this explicit with an ad directed by Spike Jones, which mocked people's sentimental attachment to belongings and directly challenged them to modernize their lives. Many of you feel bad for this lamb. That is because you're crazy. It has no feelings, and the new one is much better. What IKEA did was an extraordinary trick, which was to take the idea of home furnishings, of furniture, which, is, which was traditionally a big ticket purchase, something you bought for life, mm. a sofa, and to make it essentially the same as a, a packet of crisps that you throw mm. away. You know, everything, no matter how big it is, is ultimately disposable. Regardless if it's a sofa or a mug, it's designed with a fashion. And fashion tends to be, uh, ha ha have a limited li lifespan. You can still find this throwaway idea in IKEA's marketing. This print ad from Canada dates from 2012. But IKEA prides itself on its green credentials, like a program to get all its wood from renewable sources by 2020. Steve Howard is the global head of sustainability. I wanted to ask him how the company squared the contradiction of their green ambitions and their ads. Steve, I asked one of your former senior executives if IKEA had ushered in the throwaway consumer culture, and his answer was, yes, we definitely did. Uh, check out your chintz, which I've actually looked at online, and it's, uh, it's a, maybe we'd say recycle your chintz today if we did the same advert today. The, the whole IKEA business idea is trying to make beautiful, affordable, sustainable, quality products that uh, are good in people's homes. And the people behind the campaign to leave the lamp on the sidewalk, they said that this was actually a campaign to overcome the durable goods mindset of the consumer. So this was IKEA engineering a change in the way we look at the products we're buying so that we can throw them away. I don't think individual advertising campaigns, whatever the advertising executive was thinking at the time, change people's views completely. But why but, run a campaign if yeah, you're not trying no, to do we, that? And we wouldn't, and we clearly, that's, we wouldn't do that today. How successful are you going to be in preventing IKEA from running campaigns, advertising campaigns, that suggest we throw away our consumer goods? Jack, I think we're going to show this interview to our, our global marketing team as a training video to say, let's have more sustainability messaging on this. And uh, I think if we look at... Uh, Steve, you know, that's not enough. Oh, you need to guarantee that you're not going to have an advertising campaign that says you should throw away these goods. Because if you're genuine about sustainability, yeah. that's what you should be doing. I, could, I will raise the conversation with our marketing people around the world on this. But they've already had it, and actually... Well, uh, why just, are they still doing it, then? No, they're not still doing it. Well, actually. they did in 2012. You yeah. ran a campaign that said you should leave your sofa on yeah. the sidewalk. And we've, we've just... last year. Yeah. You can't guarantee it. I will actually make sure, while I'm here, we do not do a dispose the sofa. I'll write to our marketing matrix about it. Twenty years after it first came to Britain, IKEA was still provoking hysteria when opening a new store at Edmonton in North London in 2005. Such scenes have become increasingly common in recent years. This is what happened when Primark opened on Oxford Street. And now we have imported the pre-Christmas madness of Black Friday sales from the US. Sheree! Sheree! You're going to need to be tannoy in this. <laughs> but the biggest example of consumer frenzy in the last 10 years was the 2011 riots, which cost an estimated £200 million and affected 48,000 businesses. They began here, in Tottenham. The most targeted stores of the 2011 riots give a good indication of the most desirable goods in modern Britain. 
and more popular than clothes or trainers was consumer technology and right at the top of the shopping list, the mobile phone. The choice of phones as a prime target for the London rioters was evidence of the hold these items have over all of us. And at the heart of their allure is the idea of continuous obsolescence, the perpetual, never-ending upgrade, first dreamt up by General Motors over 50 years ago. And the man who perfected it for contemporary consumerism was Steve Jobs. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? This huge launch was Jobs introducing the very first iPhone in 2007. Since then, there have been seven generations, and the pressure to upgrade intensifies with each new launch, making us feel that our existing Apple product is out of date and obsolete. I wanted to know whether those who worked within Apple could explain whether it was great design or this relentless drive for profit that drove each upgrade. Dan Crow came into Apple as one of the chief designers in the late 1990s, working alongside Steve Jobs. I wonder, Dan, under the aegis of design, whether really what Steve Jobs was creating was an amazing, perfect money-making machine. The idea of the perpetual purchase, the rolling consumption of the upgrade. Apple got extremely good at iterating and making each step of the product better and better and better. Now, partly that drives upgrade, right? People want the latest and greatest, and I think that's quite interesting. But it's also very much about the technology and about the how can we make something better and better. But in recent years, has innovation slowed? So if you look at the latest iPhones, and you can make it a little bit faster and a little bit nicer, and you can put gold on the back, um, and you can put a fingerprint sensor on, which is great, but it isn't actually that different from the generation that came before. I think we're seeing sort of the natural plateauing of the, of the product. It's reached its, its, you know, its peak. It's, it's probably about as good as it's going to get. Apple have perfected the idea of obsolescence first revealed in the 1950s, making us want something a little newer, a little better, a little sooner than is necessary. But there are those who believe that Apple are also guilty of making it difficult for us to keep hold of our existing products, even if we don't want to change them. Back in 2004, the jewel in Apple's crown was the iPod. The silhouette motif of its advertising campaign emphasised the product's universal appeal. So one, two, three, take my hand and come with me because you look so fine that I really want to make you mine. But two brothers here in New York City started their own campaign, which they called iPod's dirty secret, that the batteries didn't last more than 18 months. Jack, Casey. welcome. Nice to meet you. Yeah, good to see you. Come on in. Thanks for your time. Casey, what prompted the campaign? Well, you know, this is 10 years ago now. I'd just gotten the iPod, and it was $400. Um, so a year later, a year and a half later, when the battery died, and it, um, I, I wanted to fix it. I wanted my iPod back. I called the Apple 800 number, the Apple Care number, and I explained that my battery was dead. Um, is the battery, how long is it? How old is it? About 18 months old. 18 months? OK, it's past its year, which basically means for um, it'll, there'll be a charge of $255 plus a mailing fee to send it to us to, re to refurb it, to correct it. But at that price, you know, you might as well go get a new one. So my brother and I came up with this idea to make a movie where we, um, we made this stencil that said iPod's unreplaceable battery lasts only 18 months. And then we, we spray painted using that stencil uh, on all of those ubiquitous iPod silhouette um, advertisements that were all over the city. And then we posted that movie online and um, it, it, it went crazy. So you got how many hits were you getting? Well, this is it was tough. This is pre YouTube, um, but I think we did around five million views uh, in, in a couple of weeks. And what did Apple do? 
Uh, Apple didn't really address it. Uh, they did shortly thereafter change the policy and enact a battery replacement policy. But it's built in obsolescence, isn't it? It absolutely is built in obsolescence. Casey's campaign has kicked off an entire movement dedicated to fighting built-in obsolescence. Here in California, a new consumer fight back is now underway. I've come to San Luis Obispo to meet one of the leaders. Carl? Hi. <laughs> Carl Weans runs a collective called iFixit. They tear apart new technology to work out how to mend it something they say big companies like Apple actively discourage. Carl, I've got an iPhone here, and the battery is wearing down. Um, I charged it this morning. It's gone down 10% already, and it's a year old. Why is it going down so quickly? It's the, the physics of these batteries, they wear out after a finite amount of time. It's a consumable, just like the tires in your car. You have to replace the battery in the phone every once in a while. The real problems with changing the battery on the phone emerged with the iPhone 4. When they released this phone, they included some new screws that we'd never seen before. So these are five-pointed star shape screws that we'd never seen in all our years of taking electronics apart. Apple invented a brand new screw specifically for this phone to keep people like you and me out. They don't want us in here able to replace our own battery. And I decided that that wasn't OK. And so I uh, reverse engineered their screw, and we started making and selling screwdrivers for the iPhone. So you invented the screwdriver that will now open this phone. Right. Okay. So, so let's dive into this one. Yeah. So that's the screw. You can see it's, it's pretty tiny. Yeah. Once you get inside the phone, there are actually Phillips screws. Right. Which continues to show the irony. They're only using these pentalobe screws on the outside to prevent you from, from getting in. Right. It's basically like a barbed wire fence, isn't it? To stop <laughs> you getting in. But then once you're in the phone, you've got recognizable um, screws that you can deal with. Right, I, absolutely. It's, it's just a gateway. They're, they're preventing you from getting inside. Once you're in, it's just like any other phone. It's very easy to work on. Apple told us that they work hard to make the most beautiful and highest quality products and devices in the world using state-of-the-art technologies. They say their products last longer, retain more of their value, and are better supported than all other products in their industry. Apple wouldn't be interviewed by me. They suggested we speak to tech analyst Benedict Evans. I wanted to know whether upgrade culture master drive to make us spend more. Do you think the iPhone is improving? I think we are still seeing really dramatic improvements in what these devices do. Is that really true? Because I spoke to Dan Crow, who is a designer for Apple, and he said that actually what's happened with the iPhone is that it's kind of plateaued. So specifically, the new iPhone has a 64-bit chip, which gives roughly double the performance for the same battery life. It has um, a camera that can record slow motion video in near darkness. It has a built-in fingerprint reader. Well, uh, I talked to the people in the queue who are waiting for the, the 5S, and I asked them why they were buying the 5S, and they didn't say because it's got all these amazing new technological innovations. But you shouldn't have to know that. As a consumer, well, you shouldn't have to know why um, you know, it's not the consumer's job to know that something is better. It's not the consumer's job to um, have an opinion on things that they haven't seen. Could you tell me about the iPod? When the iPod was developed, what was the thinking about having a non-replaceable battery? If you make a battery removable, you've got to completely redesign the device. You've then got to put a plastic case around the battery, and then you've got to create a plastic socket inside the device, and then you've got to create a removable case that will come off. You've added actually quite a lot of extra just volume to the product. And then you've got to redesign where everything is inside to make room for all of this. So what you're saying is that there's a trade-off. If the consumer wants a sleek product, they're going to have a battery that's non-replaceable, and that's the deal, and they're choosing that. Well, I think that's the thing. Is it not ushering in a kind of disposable culture, the culture of the upgrade that we have today? And it's about relentlessly buying the newest, the quickest, uh, the sleekest, and that that is, by its essence, the throwaway culture. I think that's an argument that says that actually we were a lot better off, we had much lower consumption, we had much slower lives when 80 to 90 percent of the population were peasants. Um, and the story of humanity's move away from peasantry and a life expectancy of 25 or 30 is in part a story of consumption. It's very hard to separate change and improvement from the improvement in people's lives. 
So you think it's right that we have a culture where uh, companies are prepared to upgrade things relentlessly and that we throw these things away? Well, I don't think that's really the right way of looking at it. Um, companies are continually struggling to make better products. The reason why um, I can turn on a TV set and have a reasonable expectation that it will turn on and never fail for the next 15 or 20 years is because companies are continually striving to improve their products and make better ones. Consumer technology must deliver never-ending improvement to sell to us which means we've now reached a pinnacle of obsolescence with the mobile device. But as technology expands to every consumer purchase, the need to upgrade will become an inescapable fact of life. The destination of a journey that began back in the 1920s with the humble light bulb. Manufacturers then had what seemed an impossible dream to engineer consumer behavior through planned obsolescence. Today, we live in a world of relentless, continuous spending, not so much because we were manipulated, but because we, the consumer, chose to be part of the project. OK, ready? Next yeah. time, how fear is used to make us spend. I relieve the fear. I relieve the anxiety. How our deepest emotions are manipulated. People tell me, wow, I want this car. Why? I don't know. That's, that's good marketing. <laughs> I'll meet the men who've made a fortune from exploiting our anxieties. You've no idea how much money you made. Nah, I was lucky to be part of an incredible organisation. That's one way of putting it. What secret methods do shops use to make you buy? Take a ride on the Open University shopping carousel and find out what influences you while you're shopping. Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash menu made us spend and follow the links to the Open University.